All right, I invite you to turn your Bible to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. We'll be reading verses 14 and 15. I'll ask you to stand if you're able. We'll read verses 14 and 15 of Hebrews chapter number 12. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. You may be seated. In verse number 14, we see the characteristics of a true Christian. It says in verse 14, follow. The word follow here means to pursue with full attention, care, and diligence. Uh, it's kind of like a, a tiger going after its prey, kind of like a hunter in search of his catch. Uh, there are two characteristics in our lives that we ought to pursue as Christians. And uh, we need to give our lives to developing these two characteristics. If the Holy Spirit lives within us, then we will have a desire to have these characteristics in our lives. But the flesh is always fighting against us, and so we need to be diligent about having these two things in our lives. What are these two things? Well, the first thing is follow peace when, with all men. Peace with all men. You know, we need to, in our lives, be careful that the sinful actions in my life never promote, provoke a sinful response in the lives of others. You know, it's one thing if we bring forth the truth, and the truth is offensive, as it often is, especially in this culture. Uh, it used to be that uh, you'd say truth, and even if they didn't agree with it, they would say, well, yeah, that's true, that's true. Now you say truth, and people, you know, get upset. But nothing in my life ought to cause people to be provoked. I ought to pursue peace with all men. Romans 12, verse 18 says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Romans chapter 14, verse 19 it says, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. You know, who is it that the book of Hebrews is written to? The book of Hebrews is written to a church that is being persecuted. Uh, these early Christians were often staring eye to eye with Jewish leaders who would call them perverters of the true faith. They were standing eye to eye with government officials who would call them rabble-rousers and troublemakers and those who were not submitting to the Caesar. And here they are, and they had a choice what kind of response they would have to these Jewish persecutors or to these government persecutors. And the fleshly response would be to say something or do something to irritate those who are persecuting them. But God tells us, as Christians, that we are to pursue a course of peace with all people. Look at Luke chapter 23. Jesus, as often is the case, is the example for us. Luke chapter 23. Beginning of verse number 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified Jesus and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. 
And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, This is the king of the Jews. Verse 44. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. You know, what do we see here? You know, you've heard, if you've been in church, about the abuse that Jesus took, the mocking, the scorning from religious leaders, from the soldiers, the injustice that was done to him. Yet in spite of all that happened to Jesus, one of his seven sayings from the cross was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And this gentle response from the cross provoked in this centurion you know, a Roman soldier, not known for being, you know, some of the, you know, more mild sort of people, not known for being a God-fearing person. This centurion soldier said, surely this, Jesus, was a righteous man. When we respond to those who do us wrong with a sweet spirit, pursuing peace with others, others can say of us, Certainly, this is a righteous person. I think about Stephen. You know, here he was, he was preaching the truth. <laughs> you know, and uh, you people have crucified the Son of God, and you've got blood on your hands, and so forth, preaching the truth hard. And then when he died, you know, he, you know, he, he saw the Son of God standing at the right hand of the Father, welcoming him home, he said, Father, forgive them, you know, and uh, who was standing there but Saul, the persecutor. And I believe that was put in the book of Acts because that death of Stephen influenced Saul in his softening toward the gospel and his eventual conversion to Christ a little bit later in the book of Acts. And so, it says in our text, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 14, Follow, which means pursue, purposefully seek after peace with all men. And I say that, and my wife Heather will be glad for me to say this. You know, we have six kids, and that's something you can try for in the home with your brothers and sisters. <laughs> Pursuing peace with all brothers. Pursuing peace with all sisters. And there's sometimes when you can't, uh, you know, it's not on purpose that you irritate someone else. But there are other times, and, you know, maybe you get this from your dad. You know, you just kind of have a little fun, you know, manipulating a situation or something. But that's sinful, you know. And so we need to pursue peace with all brothers and all sisters. In the church, pursue peace with all brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, we are... To be peacemakers, blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the children of God. And we need to, this is one of the pillars of true Christianity, is pursuing peace with others. Okay, what is the second pillar of Christianity? It says, follow peace with all men and holiness. Holiness is a life of purity. It's to be separated from the world and its desires, and to be separated unto God. Um, a Christian will not respond in kind to those who persecute him, and he will not deny his Lord or live in sin to win the approval of the world. This is two things that are very practical for the people that the writer of Hebrews was writing to. Number one, Pursue peace with all men. Do not respond in kind to those 
who seek to persecute you or seek to belittle you or your faith. But on the other hand, you know, do not compromise. You know, do not deny your Lord. Do not deny the scriptures. Do not compromise the scriptures. Do not live in sin or be accepting of false teachings in order to win the approval of the world either. Kind of a balancing act there. And that's where we see, you know, in our churches at large in our country, you know, we see in some a bitter spirit, you know, and, and, and people you know, telling jokes about and, and belittling those who are, who are trapped in sin or even getting angry, you know, at the, the, the government or whoever that is, you know, persecuting them or they sense is persecuting them. That's one extreme we should not follow. The other extreme is to just give in and say, well, that lifestyle is okay. Well, that, you know, we don't really believe that, you know, even though, you know, historically churches have believed that. We just, we're okay if you, if you disagree with us either. There's the two pillars of biblical Christianity. Peace with all men, but holiness, no compromise. To the early church, he says, strive to get along with your persecutors, but don't deny Christ or compromise the scriptures to achieve that peace. To us, strive to get along with all people, but do not compromise your Christian standards in order to do it. Psalm 34, verse 14 says, Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Peace and holiness are the two pillars upon which true Christianity rests. And without peace and without holiness, what is the next line in this scripture? Which is like a dagger to the heart. Without which no man shall see the Lord. The word see here means to dwell with or to enjoy. If a person has no desire to be a blessing to all people, or if a person has no desire to live in accordance with God's word, then God is asking that person in this verse, are you really my child? Are you truly born again? Are you really saved? 2 Corinthians 13, 5 invites us, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Matthew 7, 20, by their fruits you shall know them. If we do not seek to be a blessing to others and do not seek to share through life and through word the love of God as shown to us by Christ to others, if we do not you know, seek to live separated from this world and in accordance with the scriptures instead of this world system, then the question that God asks us today is this. Have you been born again? Are you my child? And this is something that the scriptures, not only in Hebrews, but elsewhere, invites us to examine, to prove, to check out the fruit in our life. And two things that there ought to be in our life, our desire to be a blessing to others, peace with all men, and number two, holiness, a stand on the word of God. Okay, now verse number 14 shows the characteristics of true Christians. Verse number 15 gives a warning to two true Christians. It says here, looking diligently. That means to inspect very closely, very strictly, to pay careful attention. Looking carefully for disobedience in the areas discussed in verse number 14. Peace with all men and holiness. You know, when we turn from our sins and welcome Jesus into our lives, there will still be those with whom we have a hard time dealing with. There will still be sins with which we will struggle until the day that we die. 
So the writer of Hebrews, who I believe is Paul, is saying here, examine your life. Inspect your life. And see if in either of these areas, peace with all men or holiness, there is something lacking in your life. You know, inspection can be very important. You know, at the airport, you have baggage checkers. If there's a bomb, a gun, as we found it at 9-11, a box cutter is found in a piece of luggage and taken out, it could mean that lives are saved. In the same way, we need to think about what happens if we as Christians harbor hatred towards someone in our lives? What if we as Christians allow sin in our lives? Here we are, the Holy Spirit is the baggage checker. And we lay out our lives before the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. You know, and there's an area that's found where there's hatred in our life. Or there's a sin that's found in our life. What can be the result of that? Well, it says here, verse number 15, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. The word grace here means favor. If we want God's favor upon our lives, then we need to remove hatred and sin as it is brought to our attention by God's Holy Spirit. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, this is why I enjoy at our church having the Lord's Supper on a regular basis. You know, some say, well, why do you try to have it every month? Well, if, you know, if I thought we could do it, I would do it every week. I mean, it's, it's a chance to examine ourselves in the light of Christ and what he has done for us. And this is what we need to do on a regular basis, is lay out our life before our God and say, see if there be any unclean way in me. Looking diligently. Because what happens when we allow hatred and sin to remain in our hearts? And this is the warning. It's not talking about here losing your salvation. It's talking about losing the favor of God in your life. And the results of that in your life. And it says here, lest any root of bitterness springing up. Root of bitterness here is a poisonous plant. It speaks of false teaching and sin in the life. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 29. Deuteronomy 29. Way back in the Old Testament. Beginning in verse number 9. It says, Keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them, that you may prosper in all that you do. Ye stand this day, all of you, before the Lord your God, your captains of your tribes, your elders and your officers, with all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and thy stranger that is in thy camp, from the hewer of thy wood into the drawer of thy water. That thou shouldest enter into covenant with the Lord thy God, and into his oath, which the Lord thy God maketh with thee this day. That he may establish thee today for a people unto himself. That he may be unto thee a God, as he hath said unto thee, and as he hath sworn unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Verse number 18. Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe 
whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God, to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. There's where the writer of Hebrews is getting this reference from. A root that beareth gall and wormwood. You know, we think about these plants we have around here, these invasive species, autumn olives, all over the place. Anytime they talk about a miracle plant to stop erosion, <laughs> that's a red flag right there because it means it grows quickly and it spreads quickly. And that's what autumn olives do. And I remember we first moved to our house and they were on the hillside and poo, poo, you know, you're just whacking at them and you're cutting them and they have these big roots and it seems like they're just always popping back up. They're always popping back up. And that's what happens in our life is these roots get established and they just bring forth a poisonous bush that keeps coming back over and over and over again. And we don't, when we do not foster in our lives peace with all men, a desire for their good, and we do not foster in our lives a spirit of holiness, a separation from sin unto God, and if we're not careful, <laughs> oh, that's a cute little plant right there. You know, these, uh, these ornamental pear trees. We've got one of those in our yard. And, you know, the least bit of wind, limbs just fall down, big limbs. And we've tried to trim that thing back, and it just sprouts back up. You know, over in Pound, on the side of the road, you have someone planting these ornamental pear trees. I'm just waiting for the day the big ice storm comes, and they're all in the middle of the road. You know, I just, I, you know, someone did that as a volunteer. I had nothing to do with that when I was on town council. But, uh, you know, here it is. And then these little seedlings fly all over the place. And you have these ornamental pears growing up on the hillside all over the place. These worthless trees that produce no fruit that you can eat. Well, see, this is what goes on. When the poison of sin enters our life, it says there, lest any root of bitterness, you cut it back and it grows back up, springing up, trouble you. The word trouble you literally means make you sick. It destroys you, hatred. It destroys you, sin. And then look at the next phrase here. And many thereby be defiled. It not only destroys us or poisons us, but it also infects those around us. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 says, Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Through one false teacher, through one Christian living in sin, many can be led away from the faith and corrupted. You know, we think about that in our own lives. And we need to be careful. Pursue, follow after, peace with all men. You know, that's the thing. You know, people know that I tend to be conservative in my political views. And that's, I think that's grounded in a biblical worldview. And that is that man is sinful. And therefore you give men a lot of authority a lot of power, they're going to be corrupt and they're going to use that for their own good and not for the good of the people. And you, you tend to think, you know, that you know, your way is right. But if you get angry with someone who takes a, a different viewpoint and you're bitter about it, then your children and those that you're around may become angry at the other side rather than seeing the other side as being souls that need to be saved. Heather and I were talking about this just the other day. And what you're doing is you're putting in the minds of young people, this is the enemy. <laughs> Not that this is someone for whom Christ died and who needs to be changed by the glorious grace of God. You see that root of bitterness. By not following after peace with all men, 
You're corrupting how people view others. You know, sin in your life. You know, little eyes are watching us. You know, others in the world are watching us. And we allow sin to creep into our lives and compromise. And they see it. And they think things like, well, if that's what a Christian is, then I'm just as good as they are. You know, come up with some excuse. Or perhaps those over whom we have influence see it in our lives. And they imitate it. Or they develop a, or they're no longer sensitive to these things. And they think it's okay and, and they do it in their lives or tolerate it. You see, these two pillars of Christianity, peace with all men, and holiness, these are two things that if we do not have in our lives, we need to examine ourselves and see if we're born again. And then once we're born again, we need to be always looking at that hillside, so to speak. Uh-oh, there's an ornamental pear. Go clip it, John. Uh-oh, there's an autumn olive. Go clip it. There's a rose bush. It's still young. Go tear it down. This is going to take over the whole place. And we need to be looking in our lives because if these things, if hatred and sin are creeping into our life, then there's a root that's forming. And it's going to poison our life and poison the lives of others as well. So in spite of everything we go through in this life, we cannot allow bitterness to ruin our lives and to condemn others to hell. We need to be aware of this. And this bitterness is not just talking about the sin of being angry all the time, but it's talking about poison. And hatred and sin are poisonous. And we need to get it out of the garden of our lives. So two things. If peace and holiness do not characterize our lives, then God wants us to examine ourselves and see if we're truly born again. It's a warning. Number two, for us as Christians, God wants us to closely examine our lives and cast out, root out, any hatred or sin that we might find there before it destroys us and it destroys others as well. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do come today and we ask you to search us, see if there be any unclean way in us, and that by your Holy Spirit help us to root it out before it takes root in our lives and produces a poisonous plant that will destroy us and others. May your Spirit be specific in our lives about the things we need to take care of in our hearts. Work, we pray, as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen.